Hey, Internet! It's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. And today's topic has actually been requested by numerous commenters, including George Hawkins, Mull17, and Autumn Leaves who've all requested my theories on the projected five seasons of the Amazon Lord of the Rings series. Autumn Leaves actually wanted me to do a separate theory video for each of the five seasons, which I was tempted to do, but since all my theories could be disproven within the first five minutes of episode one, uh, I think I'd rather minimize the damage with just one crazy theory video uh, instead of five. So in this video, I will give you my best guess for the projected five season arc of the Amazon series. On that note, there's a YouTuber by the name of Fellowship of Fans, I recommend that channel, go check it out, uh, who seems to have some good contacts in New Zealand. And they recently mentioned that season one is going to be eight episodes long, and they're currently filming episode four. And that's interesting news because years ago, it was reported that season one might be 20 episodes long. So eight actually sounds more reasonable. But it also lets us know that they're telling an eight-hour story. I'm guessing that each season will have its own internal beginning, middle, and end. As a lead into my theories, let me read to you Amazon's official show synopsis. Amazon Studios' forthcoming series brings to screens for the very first time the heroic legends of the fabled Second Age of Middle-Earth history. This epic drama is set thousands of years before the events of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and will take viewers back to an era in which great powers were forged, kingdoms rose to glory and fell to ruin, unlikely heroes were tested, hope hung by the finest of threads, and the greatest villain that ever flowed from Tolkien's pen threatened to cover all the world in darkness. Beginning in a time of relative peace, the series follows an ensemble cast of characters, both familiar and new, as they confront the long-feared re-emergence of evil to Middle-earth. From the darkest depths of the Misty Mountains, to the majestic forests of the elf capital of Linden, to the breathtaking island kingdom of Numenor, to the furthest reaches of the map, these kingdoms and characters will carve out legacies that live on long after they are gone. I'll also remind you that way back in 2019, when Amazon announced the show on Twitter, they showed the map that included Numenor, but they also quoted the One Ring to Rule Them All poem, and they posted the announcement on 3719. Three rings, seven rings, one ring, nine rings. Notice how the synopsis mentions that the story begins in a time of relative peace. It also mentions it's an era in which great powers were forged. I believe that's an allusion to the forging of the Rings of Power, which took place in a time of relative peace. As for the locations, we've got the Misty Mountains. That means Moria. And if you're talking Moria in the Second Age, you're also talking Eregion, the nearby elven realm led by Celebrimbor, very important character. Eregion was an ally and trading partner of Moria, which is likely being led at that time by Durin III. We've also got Linden, which means the Grey Havens. And at the time I think the series will start, we've got three major elven characters in that region. Gilgalad, Elrond, and Círdan. I'll note that the role of Galadriel has been cast, which means we get the realm of Lorien, or Lothlorien, on the east side of the Misty Mountains. The show also mentions Numenor, of course. Numenorians live longer than typical humans, you know, about three times the lifespan. But in a story likely to span close to 2,000 years, you're going to get a lot of turnover in the Numenorian cast. Also, the synopsis mentions the rise of Sauron, which means we'll also get Mordor in this series. One of the cryptic lines in the synopsis is the phrase, to the furthest reaches of the map. Now, it's tempting to think this is referring to the east or the south, both of which I think are in play. But note the order of the locations listed. Misty Mountains, Linden, Numenor, Furthest Reaches. Linden is west of the Misty Mountains, 
Numenor is west of Linden. And what's west of Numenor? Amman, the Undying Lands. Uh, and that's definitely the furthest reach of the map. So while the Valar and Amman aren't doing a lot during this time, I do think it's important to show why Numenor is eventually driven to invade Amman. We need to see the object of their jealousy and anger. When Numenor splits into the Kingsmen versus the Faithful, it won't be as impactful if we don't understand Amon's connection to Numenor. So I think we'll be seeing Amon as well. One of the questions I got from commenter Mull17 is how the show is going to handle the inevitable time gaps. I do think the show is going to move chronologically forward in time. It's not going to tell the story in a non-linear fashion, although they'll probably use flashbacks. So, I think they'll try to keep the major time gaps between seasons. They'll find a series of years that are event-heavy, tell those events, then jump to the next event-heavy section in the next season. And with all that said, <laughs> here's how I see the seasons breaking down. Season 1. We begin with the forging of the three elven rings in 1590 of the Second Age. And we end season one with the meeting of the first White Council in 1701. So season one would span approximately a hundred years. Now we could see a flashback to Anatar's first appearance and the forging of the nine rings, which happens significantly earlier. But I think the focus of the first season will be Sauron revealing himself and invading Eriador. By starting with Celebrimbor forging the elven rings, we're in a time of relative peace, as the show synopsis states, but we're on the cusp of a devastating time for Middle-earth. And we don't have to waste a lot of time with characters meeting each other for the first time. Everyone already knows everyone else, except we, the audience, will know that Anatar is actually Sauron. In 1600, Sauron forges the ring, completes Barad-dûr, and drops the Anatar disguise. He's full on Sauron, and I think this would happen around episode three. And this is my biggest leap, uh, walking out on a limb here a little bit, but I do believe that around that same time, 1600, we'll get the arrival of Glorfindel and the Blue Wizards from the West. They've been sent to aid in the fight against Sauron. Eventually, the Blue Wizards will introduce us to the Eastern Realms, but that might be a season two development. Glorfindel is just going to be a badass elven hero supreme. We also get to see a time of relative peace in Numenor. Now, I'm expecting to be wowed by Numenor's architecture and civilization. I think it's going to look amazing. And I think we're going to get a bit of political intrigue. Uh, Tar Telperion is queen. And she's not interested in an alliance with the elves of Middle-earth. But her nephew, Minister, is. And I think their back and forth regarding Numenor's role in Middle-earth's affairs will give us a nice window into Numenorean culture. The three elven rings get hidden. Sauron gears up for war and attacks, sacking Eregion. Maybe this is episode six, somewhere in there. The dwarves of Khazad-dûm resist Sauron, but are forced to retreat back into Moria and seal the speak friend and enter Western Gate for quite some time. Elrond's army is also defeated, and he retreats towards Rivendell in Ladris. Celebrimbor is captured, tortured, and killed. This is all in season one, unfortunately, for Celebrimbor. And Gilglad calls for aid. Numenor doesn't answer, uh, at least for a while. We cut away from the chaos and bloodshed of Middle-earth to see Numenor debating whether to intervene. In the season finale, Sauron is moving on Linden and the coast. All looks lost. Sauron's on the verge of triumph. When the Numenorean navy appears, routs Sauron's army at the Battle of the Guathlo and forces Sauron to retreat. That all happens in 1700. We then end the season with the formation of the first White Council at Rivendell, where Gilgalad, Elrond, Galadriel, Círdan, Glorfindel, the Blue Wizards, and possibly a representative from Numenor, meet to discuss the continued defense of Middle-earth. I've done a video on the history of the White Council, if you're interested in that. The council meeting can also be a reunion for Galadriel and Celeborn. They've been stranded on opposite sides of the Misty Mountains during the war, and they eventually come together at Rivendell. 
And this is also where their daughter, Calebrian, meets Elrond. They are eventually going to marry and have children, including Arwen. The season also might include a, a Tom Bombadil cameo uh, for some fan service. I know I'd like that. Anyway, uh, but so that is your season one. Season two, time jump, about 300 years. And I'll note that of all five seasons, the time period for this one, my projected season two, features the least amount of written material to go by. So I think season two gives the showrunners the most leeway plot-wise. We begin around the year 2000 of the Second Age, and this season will focus on the origins of the Nazgul, including Camel of the Easterling and the eventual Witch King, which is likely a king of Numenor, Tar Atanamir. I've done a video on that theory as well if you want to check that out. In Numenor, we start to see the shadow falling over them. A rift forming that by the end of the season will become the King's Men versus the Faithful. We may even see the King's Men attack members of the Faithful. One of the biggest sources of hostility for the King's Men is the Ban of the Valar. They can't sail west. And this is where we might see some scenes of Amon showing what Numenor is banned from. What are they missing out on? I think we'll also see Numenor colonizing Middle-earth. And by the end of the season, we'll see the beginnings of the city that will become Umbar, a major port and stronghold for the King's Men. This will allow us to see Numenorians interacting with people native to Middle-earth, folks like the Haradrim. And I think we'll see some colonial imperialism at play. I think it's through the ships sailing back and forth to the colonies that Sauron will be able to reach out to the Numenorian king, Tar Atanamir, and ultimately tempt him with one of the Nine Rings. Back in Middle-earth, the elves are still concerned with Sauron, although he's set up shop in Mordor. There's not a lot written about our elven heroes during this time, but I think this season could put them in conflict with the Easterlings and the orcs located in Mount Gundabad. And their relationship with Numenor is getting more and more strained. Speaking of the Easterlings, we get the emissaries, the Blue Wizards, who are trying to find leaders who are not beholden to Sauron in order to create a resistance movement. One of the leaders they attempt to persuade is Kamul, the Easterling. That won't go well, as we'll see Sauron has entrusted him with one of the Nine Rings of Power. And there will also be other powerful Easterlings who are given rings during this time. The Nine become completely bent to Sauron's rule, and I think the season arc will end with a big reveal of the Nine, which happens in 2251. Season three, time jump, almost a thousand years. And this is where the focus is gonna shift heavily to Numenor for a while. We start in 3175 of the Second Age. Tarpalantir is the king of Numenor. And we see that over time, Numenor has been taken over by the ideology of the King's Men. They are against the Valar and Elves. The Elvish language has been outlawed in Numenor. But Tarpalantir's mother is secretly a member of the Faithful, and she teaches her son. He embraces the precepts of the Faithful, brings back some of the old pro-Valar, pro-Elf traditions, and tries to repent for the actions of his predecessors. Since most of Numenor is on the side of the King's Men, unfortunately, Tarpalantir's actions do not go over well, and a civil war breaks out, led by Tarpalantir's younger brother, Gimilkad. Gimilkad has a son, Tarpalantir's nephew, and that Numenorian is named Farazan. Even though he doesn't show up until season three, Farazan is one of the most major roles in the Amazon series. When we first meet him, he's a military leader in Middle-earth, commanding Numenorean forces trying to expand Numenorean territory from his stronghold at Umbar. We likely see that Umbar is ruling the local Haradrim, natives of Middle-earth, by force. And we likely get introduced to Pelargir, a port town farther north up the coast from Umbar. What Umbar is to the king's men, Pelargir is to the faithful. It's their haven along the coast of Middle-earth. I think the elves, Gilgalad, Galadriel, Elrond, and such, are in conflict with the Nine. 
who are trying to spread Sauron's dominance through Eriador. Perhaps we could even set up a rivalry between Glorfindel and the Witch King, which foreshadows Glorfindel's Witch King prophecy in the Third Age. Back in Numenor, as the Civil War rages on, Gimilcad, Farazhan's father, dies. Farazhan leaves Middle-earth, returning to Numenor to pick up where his father left off, leading the rebellion against the king Tar-Palantir. Tar-Palantir then dies, leaving his only child, Muriel, as the rightful queen of Numenor. But Farazhan marries his cousin against her will and against the don't marry your cousin Numenorian law and becomes our Farazhan the Golden, king of Numenor. Back in Middle-earth, Sauron attacks the Umbar region and the Numenorian settlements along the coast, angering the new king, who sends a gigantic fleet to Middle-earth. Sauron's forces melt away before our Farazhan's forces, and Sauron surrenders. So, in the final episode of the season, our Farazhan captures Sauron and takes him back to Numenor as his prisoner. That takes place in the year 3261, which means season three covers approximately 90 years. Season four, no time jump. We actually pick up right where we left off, 3262. We may even start with a flashback to our Farazhan's youth, showing his friendship with a young Amandil. That's Elendil's father, Isildur's grandfather. And we see in present day, Amandil is on our Farazhan's council. This becomes an issue because Amandil is the leader of the faithful, while our Farazhan is the leader of the king's men. Two friends whose friendship cannot last, and Amandil is eventually dismissed from the king's council. We see Sauron led to Numenor as a prisoner, but he's got the ring, and he starts corrupting our Farazhan, saying he can conquer death if he forswears the Valar and starts worshiping Melkor. The great temple to Melkor is built. The faithful get persecuted and sacrificed to Melkor. These are dark times for Numenor. Back in Middle-earth, the elves still have the Easterlings and the Nine to deal with, and they may be running into conflict with the Numenorians from Umbar. But the main plot line is happening on Numenor. Our Farazhan builds a mighty fleet, led by his flagship, El Corundus, the Castle of the Sea. He intends to break the ban of the Valar, sail west, and invade Amon. Amandil sees what our Farazhan is planning, knows what that means for Numenor, and makes plans for the faithful to escape the island when necessary. He entrusts his son, Elendil, with the plans, and Elendil prepares nine ships to sail to Middle-earth when the time comes. Amandil then attempts to sail west himself, ahead of our Farazhan to speak with the Valar and seek the aid of Manwe. He does so and is never seen again. Our Farazhan's armada sets sail. They land on Amon. The Valar call upon Eru for aid and he breaks the world, <laughs> crushing our Farazhan's forces and his ships, sinking Numenor into the sea, Atlantis style. Sauron's physical form is destroyed, forcing his spirit to return to Middle-earth with the ring. Our Farazhan's wife, Muriel, tries to avoid the flood by climbing the sacred mountain, Menel Tarma, but she's washed away. And we end the season with the nine ships of Elendil, carrying seven Palantiri, sailing away from Numenor as it sinks into the sea. The year is 3319, meaning the season covers about 60 years. So now we come to the final season, season five. Another time jump, over a hundred years to the year 3429. We begin with Sauron taking Minas Ithil by force. Isildur and his family flee the city, and this kicks off the War of the Last Alliance, the focus of season five. Gil-galad and Elendil forge the Last Alliance of Elves and Men, and the allied army marches to Imladris, Rivendell, where they make camp for three years, forging weapons and making plans. The show might include the men of Dunharrow, the Oathbreakers. They refuse to join the alliance when called by Isildur, and so he curses them, 
to haunt the paths of the dead. Of course, that curse lasts until Aragorn lifts it in The Lord of the Rings. So during this time, we have the major players, both Numenorian and Elven, in the same vicinity. This becomes the culmination of all the years of resistance to Sauron. Perhaps we could have a callback to the White Council meeting from Season 1. A similar council could meet, where we get a reunion of the major Elven players, and we see the three Elven rings crafted by Celebrimbor so long ago. In the East, Tolkien's later writings indicate that the Blue Wizards successfully hinder Sauron's plans, aiding to the success of the War of the Last Alliance. So perhaps we see some of that success. Uh, the Blue Wizards cutting off a portion of Sauron's support from the Easterlings. As the Alliance marches from Rivendell to Mordor, as Frodo will do many years later, they're joined by the Elves of Greenwood, led by Orifer and his son Thranduil, Legolas's dad, and the Elves of Lothlorien, led by Amdir. And we're told that the Dwarves of Moria sent an army to fight on the side of the Alliance during the war. So this also harkens back to Season 1, when the Dwarves fought Sauron on behalf of the Elves of Eregion and lost, and closed themselves off from the world. This is them re-emerging to aid in the fight against Sauron. In an attempt to slow down the Alliance, Sauron burns down the gardens of the Entwives, killing many of them, and creating an area known as the Brownlands, uh, which still have that name late into the Third Age. So we could see that tragic act played out as witnessed by the Alliance commanders as they move through that area. Then we get one of the most famous battles in Tolkien mythology, the Battle of Daggerlad. The Alliance is victorious, but Amdir and Orifer are slain making Thranduil the new king of the Greenwood Elves. And we get the origin of the Dead Marshes, due to the large number of troops who fell there. And that'll obviously come back into play during the time of the Lord of the Rings. We then get the Siege of Barad-dûr. This technically lasts for seven years, but it will likely get condensed down to maybe an episode or two. Elendil's son, Anarion, is killed during the siege. And then, we end Season 5 with the battle depicted at the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring film. Elendil and Gil-galad fall, the sword Narsil is broken, and Isildur cuts the ring from Sauron's hand. And so in another callback to Season 1, we see the One Ring keeping alive the spirit of the one who forged it, Sauron. And in fact, it's Sauron who is the character that ties the five seasons together. More so than any other single character, this story will revolve around him. And that ends the Second Age and the Amazon series. Again, this is just a theory on how these seasons are going to progress. Actually, I don't think we're going to have long to wait for season one. So I think there's a good chance we'll see how wrong my predictions are <laughs> by the end of 2021. But thanks for the suggestion, George and Autumn Leaves. I really appreciate it. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye!